Hello and welcome to this broadcast by Brexit Watch. I'm your host, Jonathan Zaxby. Today we are delighted to welcome the Conservative Member of Parliament, Sir Desmond Swain, to Brexit Watch. Sir Desmond, welcome to Brexit Watch. Really good to have you today. Thank you. Um, Sir Desmond, I'd like to begin with the current uh, situation. We, we thought the first lockdown was the only lockdown. Now, obviously, we've heard over the weekend that England is entering a second lockdown. What are your thoughts on this and the government's current handling of the coronavirus crisis? Well, I, my thoughts are what the Prime Minister thought a couple of weeks ago when he told us another lockdown would be a disaster. I think it is a disaster. Uh, and it comes down to a judgment call in the end between the certainty of the economic damage, the unemployment, the loss of livelihoods, the years that we will have to spend paying back all the shed loads of money that we are borrowing, which will mean reductions in uh, investment elsewhere in the public sector uh, that will be a consequence on that. So it's that certainty as against the possibility of the NHS being temporarily overwhelmed. Uh, and I, I'm not persuaded that that possibility is a very likely one, notwithstanding the evidence that's been presented somewhat disputedly in the last few days. But nevertheless, my view is it's that certainty of economic disaster as against the possibility of a health disaster. I don't dispute for one moment it would be disastrous if hospitals were to be overwhelmed. Uh, we have seen it before. It's not a pleasant sight. We've had it in flu epidemics with people being treated on the corridors and on trolleys and undoubtedly more people would die as a consequence. But I think you have to take a mature and there is no good outcome but a, a judgment between these two alternatives. And my judgment goes with the, you know, actually the economic disaster and the number of deaths that causes in the long term is a worse possibility than the possibility of the NHS being temporarily overwhelmed, which I'm doubtful about. How widespread do you feel your opinion is on the Conservative backbenchers right now? Well, in, in terms of actual measurable votes, it hasn't been very strong thus far. I think about 40 Conservatives voted against the imposition of the 10 o'clock curfew. Uh, when it was, uh, we were debating and voting on the statutory instruments on face masks uh, and things like that, it was, you know, it was in single figures. Uh, so I never like to over egg these things. However, when I have made my feelings clear in the chamber, uh, a very large number of colleagues have said they agreed to me with me, including ministers. So I think the feeling is, is very widespread. I don't dispute for a moment that there are people who are, there are government loyalists who believe that it's doing the right thing and however unpleasant it is, it's the right course of action. Uh, and they're entitled to their point of view. And I don't dispute for one moment that they, they're doing that for the best what they believe is the best possible interests of the country. I just happen to disagree. So Desmond, if you were Boris Johnson, what would you be doing right now? Well, I, what I would have done is that I would have investigated the possibilities of uh, providing rather more uh, shielding of some sort or protection for those people who are clearly going to be vulnerable and frankly, I'd let the rest of us get on with our lives. Reality is that, you know, 1,700 or so people die every day. And, you know, COVID is by no means chief amongst their killers. Indeed, over the last few weeks, flu has killed more than COVID. When we have a heavy flu epidemic, a bad flu winter, you know, it can kill 80,000 people. Do we shut down the economy? Do we behave in this extraordinary way? I can understand entirely the fear of the, of the damage of people seeing those dreadful scenes at hospitals that were seen in Northern Italy, which would be worse in the winter because you've got flu, coronavirus and novel virus all at the same time. I can understand the desire to try and prevent that, and I'd certainly try and prevent that, but I would seek to do it by keeping the economy open. I'm not in favour of any kind of lockdown. Lockdowns are proven to do only one thing, make us all poorer and make poor people even poorer. 
Can you expand a bit more on that? What do you see as the long term ramifications of this second announced lockdown? Well, we've already seen um, it's Sage itself speaking of 180,000 extra deaths as a consequence of lockdown because of the failure to treat a whole series of other conditions. That was something that, that one of their papers produced early in the last lockdown. Uh, uh, and the government has its own projections over, over the next couple of years for people who will die from not having been treated for all sorts of other conditions. What you don't see is the long-term effect on people's lives. What, what's our means of measuring the impact of the misery of prolonged unemployment? of people's life chances being hugely reduced if they're young at the moment, just coming out of university. All the evidence shows that if you start your life in unemployment, yeah. it's very, very hard to get out of. Yeah. It, it's, it's the sheer drain on the economy that paying back billions and billions of pounds will take over the next generation to, to deal with that. And the diminution in investment elsewhere in the economy unless we decide we're going to pay for it all through inflation uh, which comes with its own disasters you mentioned sage uh, what are your opinions on the scientific advice uh, that the prime minister is receiving at the moment well if you ask a scientist how do you stop a disease that spreads through social contact those scientists will say you've got to stop human contact which is effectively what they've done but it's it, uh, and I was being asked this morning, well, shouldn't there be economists on, on SAGE? Well, you don't need an economist to tell you that stopping human contact is a disaster. And it's for politicians to weigh up what they're told by scientists that they need to do as against the economic and social costs of that. That's our job. We are not prisoners of the scientists. We're not told to be here that we have to follow the science because the science itself is disputed, just as economics is disputed, so science is disputed. I mean, I receive, because of the stance that I've taken, I receive a huge volume of correspondence from the ordinary GPs who are seeing the effect of this on the ground through to professors in eminent university hospitals saying, you've got it right and Sage has got it wrong. The science is disputed and frankly, what we need is a sage that represents more of that dispute rather than an orthodoxy saying you've got to do this. We've seen the polling, Sir Desmond, it, it, it seems to indicate widespread support for lockdown, although this is disputed and we've seen the issue of preference falsification before. And of course, um, so long as government support schemes are in place, there may be more support for lockdown as a full economic um, ramifications of this uh, is revealed, of course, that may well change. Do you think there is concern about the consequences for the government, for the Conservative Party, um, with the current approach? Um, we heard over the weekend uh, the, the relaunch of the, of the Brexit Party as a, sort of a, a new reform UK. Do you think this is a concern for Conservatives that actually there could be some economic, uh, sorry, some electoral consequences for the party? Well, it's much wider. Yeah. Um, but you're right. The, 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 the whole notion that individuals and families are better at assessing what is best for them and doing it than have the state do it for them is clearly a fundamental conservative principle. So it is invariably the anger and frustration in my um, post bag is overwhelmingly, but not exclusively, but overwhelmingly from people of a conservative disposition who are appalled at what has happened. But I'd go wider than that. So, so, so that's where I think, yes, you're going to run into an electoral problem. But there's a more fundamental and very worrying issue for me. I mean, I'm, I'm horrified that the British people have just seemed to have shrugged off the state imposing all sorts of sanctions upon them and upon their most fundamental liberties, who they may meet, when they may meet them, what they must wear when they meet them, interfering in your family life, interfering in your travel, in your ability to do almost anything. And extraordinarily, the silence of the churches as public worship is closed down in a country that believes 
in freedom of expression and religion. These are things that are of enormous consequence for me. And, and the fact that the government's just been able to do it with so little opposition strikes me as deeply worrying for our future because governments get into the habits of ruling by diktat. And if people get into the habit of having their fundamental freedoms taken away, something we would never have tolerated in the past. Crikey, what future is there for us? Desmond, leaving um, the current coronavirus crisis aside for, for a moment, um, obviously the uh, EU-UK negotiations during this transition period are still ongoing, rather overshadowed, it must be said, by, by what's happening domestically with, with COVID. But the UK is still due to leave the transition period at the end of the year. I know you're a, uh, um, you're a skeptic, you're a Brexit supporter. Um, given what we've seen, given the opposition to the uh, withdrawal agreement, concerns over the Northern Irish Protocol, we've had the internal market bill a month or two ago uh, designed to correct some of the pernicious aspects of the withdrawal agreement. What do you see in terms of the state of play of the current uh, EU-UK negotiations? Do you think there'll be a deal or do you think no deal is, is the more likely outcome now? Well, it's, it's still too soon to tell, um, but I, I mean, my, my hope is for a deal. I've always believed in free trade and we have free trade uh, with the bulk of uh, Europe. And therefore, I, I think it would be a shame if we were to return to tariffs and quotas and rules of origin with that very significant proportion of our trade. It would be it would damage them and it would damage us. So I certainly want to see an agreement, uh, but I don't want an agreement that would um, limit our options economically for the future uh, in terms of building a freer trading arrangement with the rest of the world. And clearly uh, there are aspects of the withdrawal agreement that are, how shall I put it, diplomatic, less than optimal. Uh, and, you know, whatever agreement we make needs to minimise the impact of the effects on Northern Ireland separating it from us uh, and that. So I, I don't want an agreement at any price. If you want me to, if I were to put money on there being an agreement, I would probably put 50 quid either way. I think it's a bad evens at the moment as to whether we get an agreement or not. Of course, the question is, what sort of agreement will we have? Will it be the bare bones of an agreement? And I suspect that it's more likely to be that, and that over the next couple of years, all sorts of other deals will be done uh, to address areas of mutual interest, which have simply not, we've simply not had the time to concentrate on uh, during you know, this period, partly from coronavirus, but partly be way, be, by the way that the EU set out to negotiate by insisting um, on doing it the way it always does uh, and making sure that we were the ones that gave ground. And when they finally discovered that we're not prepared to just roll over, all of a sudden, the whole negotiating process that ought ordinarily to have taken place is now trying to be shunted into a very short period of time, much shorter than will otherwise have been the case. Do you think there are concerns in government about the prospect of no deal and how that may be perceived given the current crisis, the current COVID crisis? Yeah, undoubtedly. Um, the, you, you don't want to add to any um, perception of mayhem. And, you know, I just draw an example. Just recall the, uh, um, you, you, you were too young, comrade. But for those of who do recall, and the historians of the period recall the, our rejection from the state, the exchange rate mechanism. And if you ask people who were, you know, uh, about at the time and adult at the time and informed at the time, what will they recall? They'll recall interest rates at 15%, you know, and the mayhem and the misery and the disaster. Well, actually, it was a huge release and the recovery began almost immediately. And hey, interest rates were at 15% for half a day, half a day. But nevertheless, that impression of chaos cost the Conservative government 
its entire reputation for sound economic management. And, you know, that those few days of chaos created this long running um, impression that was it took, took almost 10 years to, 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 to recover from. And that's the danger is that you have a 1st of January with, you know, all sorts of problems at the ports and all sorts of other issues and, and an impression of chaos, uh, which can have a long lasting effect. And therefore, you know, I can understand ministers seeking to avoid that as far as possible. Desmond, final question. If, uh, if the UK remains on its current trajectory, if, 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 if things as they look now continue, where do you think the country will be in six to 12 months time? Uh, six to 12 months time is a very short period of time. Um, I still think we'll be, if I'm, you know, I'm, if I'm being realistic, I think we'll still be below um, the, or somewhat below the level of GDP that we had this time last year. Um, there's always the possibility of a great release and a bounce back, but you know, I can't see where it's going to come from. Um, we will have lots and lots of uh, industries which will have effectively gone under um, and a huge amount of unemployment to address. I think in the longer term, you ask me the longer term, I think the future is bright, uh, mm. but I think we've got a good couple of years uh, of economic misery as a consequence of the disruption of the last eight months. Mm. I think we share that opinion. Um, I think we're out of time. So, so Desmond Swain, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you.